Dr. Time Flab, and welcome to Quantum Mechanics. We're doing our first lecture, looking at quantum mechanics from a physics perspective instead of a math perspective. Today, we're going to look at the specific experiment that familiarized the discovery of quantum mechanics, and you know why exactly it was created. So now, first of all, how is quantum mechanics different from reality? Or sorry, classical mechanics. Well, as everybody knows, the only difference between the two is the word quantum. No, I'm just kidding. The difference, mathematically, as I said in our other series, is about the existence of wave functions, which are probability density-like functions, which essentially measure how likely an object is to be at a certain point or in a certain region. But physically, it's essentially about measurability, and not in the analysis sense. So what's so bad about measurability? Well, here's a problem. There were many, many, many experiments that led up to the existence of quantum mechanics. There was Young's double slit experiment. There was so there was Young's double slit experiment. There was Rutherford's gold foil experiment. There was the classic ultraviolet catastrophe, or Raleigh gene law. Sorry, no, I shouldn't draw it like that. But the number one discovery to highlight, or at least the number one that my book highlights, is what we call the Stern-Gerlach experiment, which was, as the name says, theorized by theoretical physicist Otto Stern in 1921 and carried out successfully by Gerlach, a research student, in 1922. So what did the Stern-Gerlach experiment actually provide? Well, here was what the experiment was saying. For a very, very, very long time, since Earth did, people had known that if you take current in a straight line, there's a looping magnetic field around it. And in the same way, if you take current in a loop, there was a magnetic field going straight through it. In fact, of course, this is how the copper coil came to be. So, electric current in this loop generates a magnetic field in one particular direction perpendicular to the electric field. Pretty predictable. But now, with all of the theories developed by people like Bohr, stating that there were actually particles inside atoms that made them up, including something at the center called a nucleus, and things, things seemingly orbiting around, which we called electrons. Well, it was said that these electrons were the key to electricity. Current was just these electrons flowing through a wire, ionized and free. And so the theory was, Maybe an electron in its own orbit around the nucleus is kind of like a bunch of electrons being put through that wire in the same way that it'll generate a magnetic field perpendicular to it. And maybe using that magnetic field 
we can sort of measure the orientation that an atom is in or the strength of the magnetic field generated or whatever. So the generation of this thing was called the magnetic moment. And it's very easy to derive. Eventually, what we were getting was the gyromagnetic ratio, or the gyromagnetic ratio. It's not pronounced like the food. The gyromagnetic ratio is, well, as it says, the ratio between gyro, which is essentially the word representing angular momentum, how much something was spinning, of course, related to the food, because the food is made out of chicken spun on a stick, and the magnetic part, because, of course, it's the ratio to the strength of the magnetic field. We had a prediction of what the gyromagnetic ratio was supposed to be. Whoa, what's that on the floor? Ugh. We had a prediction of what the gyromagnetic ratio was supposed to be for an atom. And so, all that was left was to test it, which is what Stern came up with in 1921. And so, how did Stern propose this test? Well, to actually see the minuscule effect that these magnetic moments were having, there wasn't really equipment delicate enough at the time to measure those directly. So the ingenious idea was, as ancient Greek philosophers discovered, magnets interact with magnets. There was a reason that lodestones could pick up anything, metals, and they worked as compasses, too. So, these magnets interacted with magnets, and the fact that compasses worked provided the insight that maybe Earth was a magnet, too. And so, what we were aiming to do here is put these guys, the atoms, in a larger magnetic field as well, and see if they interacted with the larger magnetic field. That would confirm both if they generated a magnetic field, how strong it was, and which direction it was moving. Simple. So, now we knew what the experiment would be generally about. We would take a magnetic field, somehow shove Adam through it, and on the other side, we get results. Simple. But how do you actually carry it out? Well, it's more complicated. But eventually, Stern came up with a better idea. What he was going to do was first take one end of this horseshoe magnet and make it sharp. What that did was actually change the magnetic field, since, of course, magnetic fields obey an inverse square law with respect to distance. Which means that the closer you get, the stronger it gets. You probably know that from experience. Name Charlotte. Huh? What is the name of the experiment? The Stern Gerlach experiment. S T E R N. I'll type it in for you. So this is our basis. Step two, we need to get Adam in here somewhere. Ah. Well, one atom alone shouldn't be enough to produce that magnetic field that everyone's looking for, right? So maybe we need a whole beam of silver atoms. Why silver? Well, silver was both readily obtainable in large quantities for a low price, was not going to kill you if you picked it up. And the most crucial part, since silver's atomic number is odd, it will essentially act 
like one particle with half spin. More on what that means later. So, it satisfied those three criteria. Easy to get, not going to kill you, and, you know, it has the right atomic number. And so, we went with a beam of silver atoms. So, somehow, we were going to shoot a beam of silver atoms into sharp magnet thing. Step three, how do we actually measure where it's going? Well, that's probably the simplest step of all. We know that it's going to be deflected somehow. So all we need to do is measure how much it's deflected by. And to do that, we just need to see where it goes when it hits the wall some finite amount later. Because there's not really significant magnetic field in this distance. And so it's going to go through, get deflected. No, not like that. Sorry. Get deflected. And since there's no magnetic field, it's not going to accelerate much here. And so, we can see that it hits the wall right here. Our detector will go off, and through some mathematics, we'll be able to trace that back all the way here and figure out how much it accelerated by. Step 3 done. We have now figured out how to measure results. Step 4. How do we actually get the strong beam of silver atom? Well, Stern didn't figure this out, but the experimenter, Gerlach, did. What we were just going to do was use something called a collimator. A collimator essentially takes a bunch of atoms. So first, these atoms were vaporized. Silver gas is not readily available on the market, so they had to vaporize solid silver in order for it to work. So now we have a bunch of silver and gas form in this giant oven. And what we're going to do now is collimate it, which means we're going to use a very slick device that uses the properties of reflection very nicely. It'll take any bouncing silver atom and through its curving properties, slowly straighten out the beam, so that at least by the time it reached the barrel or nozzle or whatever you want to call it, the spread was at least a little bit smaller than what it could have been, because you don't want to get silver atoms sprayed on your magnetic equipment. And also because doing that would have been pretty chaotic, because you wouldn't have been able to tell which way it went in, so how could you tell which way it went out? You can know which way it went out, but that wouldn't let you trace back exactly how much it accelerated. And so, over here, this is essentially how the stern gerlach experiment worked. So, we collimated these guys, and they deflected onto the wall. That simple. Now, because, of course, collimators aren't perfect, they should leave some amount of spread, as we outlined. And so, this spread should influence these atoms to go in all kinds of directions. Even if the collimator was perfect, surely these atoms all have different orientation. One could be this way, one could be that way, one could be this way. It wouldn't make sense if they all had the same orientation, right? And so, the experiment was run by Gerlach, and it turned out, they did not all have the same orientation. Good. What instead happened was instead of a continuum, like they expected, everything being hit, they didn't get one, but two unique orientations. There was one giant clump of them that went this way, and another giant clump of them that went that way. Why? That question was the catalyst behind quantum mechanics. Well, along with so many other things. This is overcomplicating it. But this question is a very nice illustration of the strangeness of quantum mechanics. We know these things have to have been 
in all different kinds of orientations. So what happens such that you can't just say the collimator thing was too good because it didn't give just one orientation. It somehow gave two. There's something deeper going on. And what is that deeper thing? Well, back then, scientists thought it was entirely classical. Maybe these atoms just happened to align with the same amount of angular momentum. Heck, maybe that's just what magnets and other kinds of things tend to do. That's just what happens, right? Magnets tell other atoms, sorry, magnets tell atoms they affect to just orient all in the same position, or maybe two different positions depending on which way they went, or I don't know which pole was closer to them. We can't tell. But it turned out that it was not classical. In fact, the classical model was completely wrong. In fact, in fact, the spin of these particles was not something that could just change on a whim or with a magnet. Spin, this sort of angular momentum that you would expect, was a fundamental quantity. It literally could not change. And not just that, unlike all of the quantities known in classical physics, it was discretized. What that means is that it kind of has a staircase of possible values. It can be a half, it can be one, it can be one half, but never anything in between. Whereas, all quantities we knew before were like a ramp. They could perfectly stop anywhere and be totally fine. You want your kinetic energy to be pi joules? Sure, why not? And so, spin doing this presented a problem. Was every quantity like this? And what happened to physics when all of these things were now quantized? What even, oh, sorry, discretized. Didn't mean to say that. Why are they even discretized in the first place? Now, you know what another word for discretized is? Quantized. Mostly because, you know, quantized comes from quanta, which is the word for a small entity, which means that something quantized can only be in multiples of some small entity. So, everything in physics is quantized? How can we describe this? Maybe with some sort of mechanics. Quantum mechanics. That's the message behind quantum mechanics. Tomorrow, we'll be getting into some more of the specifics, including some experiments using Stern-Gerlach machines. For now, thanks everyone for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.